basically today I'm going to be talking about this uh, passion project of mine called GenomeJS. Uh, and I want to show some cool stuff I think you can use it for. My name is Contra. You can find me at github.com slash contra, twitter.com slash contrahacks. I co-founded Fractal in 2010. We do a bunch of open source work uh, in the node space and we do consulting and training for full stack JavaScript. Here's a photo of me uh, trying to be Mr. Cool Guy in uh, New York. Cool like fire. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just started using Keynote again. And man, these animations, they have like cool 3D cube crap and like it's super fun to just totally go crazy with it. Anyways, uh, DNA, the essence of life, is our shared source code. It is the blueprint for our biological processes. Everything about us as humans is essentially the compiled output of this source. Genome sequencing, provided by companies like 23andMe, Ancestry, and Family Tree, provide crucial insights into ourselves and let us discover things we never really thought to look for. As Lao Tzu once said, he who knows others is wise, he who knows himself is enlightened. So this project started when I had my genome sequence last year. I'm not like a geneticist, I don't know anything about biology, but I was super intrigued by the similarities between code and DNA. So I spit in this tube here that they sent me in the mail and mailed it to San Francisco, then waited a couple of weeks until I got an email saying that, hey, your results are ready. After getting the results back, and I was pretty unsurprised, I came back like 50% Mexican, 50% European, which is like, I already knew that. Um, and then they have like the whole thing where they don't show you as much as they can because like the whole like government intervention and everything. So that, that's no good. Um, so anyways, I was pretty unsurprised, uh, but then I noticed this little download link in the corner and I thought, hmm, what does that thing do? So after clicking that, I get this 30 megabyte CSV file uh, has uh, 967,000 rows in it. And at this point I'm thinking something along the lines of PC load letter <laughs> Sorry, in attack, anybody? <laughs> what is this data? Uh, is this what 23andMe uses to find its conclusions? So I went to Google like, yo, what even is all of this crap? Uh, trying to figure out how this was cool and what I could potentially do with this information. So I found out that each row describes a unique mutation called a single nucleotide polymorphism. Uh, if you aren't interested in tongue twisters, you can just call it a SNP short or, or the pronounced version of SNP. Uh, this 30 megabytes of data is basically a diff of my DNA against the standard human genome. Each SNP has a unique ID and a value. The value is your A's, T's, C's, and G's you learned about in biology. At a high level, our DNA is kind of like a key value store, similar to Redis or LevelDB. <coughs> Sorry, I'm coming down with a little bit of a cold. Uh, even easier for us JavaScript people, just think of it like an object. So key, Unique ID, value, A's, G's, C's, T's, pretty easy. Now one SNP isn't exactly a direct link to a physical mutation. There isn't just one key value pair for blue eyes or one key value pair for green eyes. Multiple SNPs combined are what result in these characteristics. To describe this logic, the concept of a genus set came about. A genus set is essentially the if condition for determining these characteristics. In this example, we want to know if a person is immune to food poisoning. From a business standpoint, this is extremely vital information for figuring out who goes on a carnival cruise or not. The logic for this one is actually pretty simple. If they have the SNP RS601338 and the value is AA, then life is good. They're immune to norovirus. Uh, norovirus is the most common form of food poisoning. This person should definitely take a carnival cruise as soon as possible. <laughs> Norovirus immunity is probably like the easiest genus set out there since it only deals with like one SNP. You know, that's easy. You just check, hey, does this equal this? Cool. Yes, no. Uh, this sample genus set determines a person's biological gender, and you can see it's a lot more complex and involves a total of 32 SNPs. And you can see we essentially have okay, does this SNP not exist? If so, then true. Otherwise, if at least three of these values evaluate to true, then we can assume that like this is this way. So it's kind of fuzzy, uh, the logic here, and a little more complex. 
So how do I know all of this? I'm dumb, like I said earlier, I'm not a geneticist. I don't know anything about SNPs or DNA or whatever. Uh, but there's this amazing website called Snippedia, and basically all of these people compiled like all these research papers and all this like wealth of knowledge uh, from all over the internet into one place and put it in like this easy to use format. Like that query I showed earlier uh, for determining biological gender is just taken directly from Snippedia that's like on there. So the logic, like somebody actually worked that out. They have a whole like language that they list these things in. Uh, it's pretty cool. So this makes it possible for non-scientists like me to actually utilize this massive amount of data. So serious props to the Snippedia people. They get my Holy Grail award for 2014. Uh, because like without Snippedia, I would have just been like, well, cool, this data is fun, but I don't want to read research papers all day. So I'm going to do something else. Uh, so the fact that they made this accessible is just super cool. So you can simply just look up any SNP and see what it does, or you can look up pre-research genosets like this one. Uh, so this one I think is blue eyes that I have listed on here. So all of these values have to evaluate to true, and then this other genoset, which then you can go find the formula for that one, can't be true. Uh, so yeah, you can look up these genosets and see essentially like which SNPs are related to it and how. So like uh, if you were to click that GS256 link and go back, it'll have like a list of other eye colors and like different SNPs that might be related to like uh, the color of the eyes or like different like melanin exposure and just all sorts of cool stuff. So with these resources, you can start analyzing your own DNA uh, and like find out stuff like what diseases you're prone to or what types of drugs don't work on you. Like I think uh, when I ran some stuff against my genome, I found out like hepatitis C treatment won't work on me. So I'm definitely not gonna get hepatitis C uh, because that would be bad. Uh, anyways, you might also be in the mood for interesting things like where your ancestors were from, uh, how fast you metabolize caffeine and alcohol. Maybe like uh, if you, whenever you drink alcohol, your cheeks start blushing red. Well, you can find out why. Uh, you can just look in your genome for that why your bones are funky, why you cry during the notebook, or whatever you want, really. Uh, maybe you just want to compare yourself uh, to celebrities and see like how similar you are. Uh, I personally want to compare myself to Jaden Smith and really figure out my differences. Uh, I want to know like which, which snips are involved with coming up with quotes like these, because I want to be able to do that, and I want to be able to uh, go and like change my DNA to be more like that. Uh, why can't we all do this? I, I strive for a world where everybody can come up with these, these good quotes. <laughs> Those 3D animations I told you. Uh, you can even see what your kids will look like with another person. So right now there's sites that do this, like this one, makemebabies.com. Uh, which essentially just merge your, uh, merges your faces together to create a little monster baby like this one. Uh, so I think soon you could be uploading your DNA and receiving like a realistic prediction of what a child with Donald Trump will look like. Um, and I think that like this is the future of the web. Um, so yeah, I, I think the implications of this data aren't just for like finding out cool stuff about yourself. I mean, that's fun for a couple of minutes, but you know, after you find out everything, it's like, cool, what's next? What can I do with this? Um, so I think the implications of this data reach far into web application development as well. So essentially, like, I'm, I'm thinking I want to live in a world where I can upload my DNA to services I use to like, help configure them to do all sorts of cool stuff so they just like, know about me. Um, so I guess you can kind of think of it as like a personal configuration file of sorts. So for example, uh, a set of like possible things people could use this for come in the physical world. Uh, Google knows you have sensitive eyes, so they give you driving directions where you aren't facing the sun. Uh, think of how many like car accidents that could prevent every year, just a little tiny tweak like that. Uh, Apple knows your muscle performance, so Siri isn't gonna route you walking directions, walking up a bunch of steep hills in San Francisco like this one. Um, and I, I think like little tiny tweaks like this are really going to be like key in the future to just improving quality of life and, and like decreasing traffic accidents and all sorts of stuff like that. So we also have like dietary restrictions. 
Yelp knows you have a gluten intolerance, so it's just going to automatically filter out places that don't have any gluten-free options. Uh, I know my co-founder is gluten-free. I think he would enjoy that. Uh, I wouldn't because I never go eat with him. Uh, like, let's say your calendar knows you metabolize caffeine slowly, so it warns you when you check into a coffee place on Foursquare, hey, don't drink too much coffee or whatever, you've got a meeting later, you don't want to be all jittery or whatever. Uh, or hey, maybe you shouldn't stay up super late drinking coffee, working on your talk the night before you have a conference at 9 a.m. <laughs> So this field is kind of the wild west right now. There's still an insane amount of research to be done before this is like a feasible thing to do. Uh, but I want to plant this idea in everyone's heads today. This is going to be a thing, I think. Genetic information is massively useful and we have the means to actually use it and work with it now. I think these kinds of small features can uh, like improve the quality of life, like I said, and just like just across the board. I mean. No longer will you have to go in and like fine tune all these preferences and crap. It'll just work. You just upload your DNA and it just knows everything about you. It sounds kind of creepy, but I don't know. I kind of think it's cool. Like just from a time-saving perspective, like how much time that could save. So here's one other idea. Let's start hacking our DNA. We might not be able to merge the changes into master and deploy it uh, to production right now, but we can dream. So, for example, the SNP RS6152 has a research link to male baldness. If your value for this key is AA, you're going to go bald. If you have GG, uh, you won't go bald. So wouldn't it be cool if you just could, like, swap that value out or something? And like I said, you can't really, like, deploy it back to your body, but we can at least start planning for a time maybe where that will be possible. So that's exactly what I started doing. Uh, you <laughs> I have two files on GitHub, one with my current living DNA, what's currently deployed. Uh, I should probably have branches set up for that, maybe like some CI or something. Uh, and one with my ideal DNA. When I find something I can make a little bit perfect, uh, I commit a change to my ideal DNA file. So one of my favorite tweaks was increasing muscle performance, and this spawned like a really awesome comment chain about uh, pre-workout drinks and like, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Um, so yeah, the SNP here is uh, RS181573, so you can see that key over there, no. and you can see I switched the value from CT to CC, which is essentially going to let me achieve like supersonic levels of speed, I'll just be like sprinting down the street and everything. Um, so CT here was like all right, like I could be a sprinter if I like trained and everything, but I don't want to train. I want to just be able to run fast right out of the box. So uh, switching that out lets me do that. Um, if you want my DNA to make clones of me, you can go to that URL and that has both my ideal DNA and my uh, current DNA, which is all right, it's okay. Um, if you like, also want to meet me at the after party and you think like you don't like me or like I'm kind of an asshole or something, PRs are accepted. <laughs> I just wanted to show like this really cool art project uh, that's also in the space. It's super fun but maybe a little creepy. Uh, the project is called Stranger Visions by artist Heather Dewey Hagborg. So basically she set out to create portrait sculptures from genetic material collected in public spaces. The theme of the project is like supposed to be creepy, showing the possibility for like genetic surveillance by some future like overreaching government or entity or something like Arizona. Um, sorry, I'm, fr I'm from Phoenix. It's okay, I can say that. Uh, anyways, I'm a little more optimistic. I think the technology behind it is really cool. I'm not convinced that the government is competent enough to like walk around and like use it um, correctly. Uh, so this first portrait uses a cigarette found on a corner in Brooklyn as the sample. So you can see this is the sample, this is the 3D, uh, I think they like 3D printed it or something, uh, output. Now somebody can park a car and like wait for this person to show up again and confront them for littering a cigarette on the ground. They can be like, what the hell? Uh, so one thing I took away from this is that anything you touch in the real world is not really anonymous anymore. Like if you leave a fingerprint somewhere, maybe a drop of sweat or like saliva on a, you know, a water bottle or whatever, somebody can take that, create like a 3D reconstruction of you as a human and then like use that to track you down or something. So there's like some implications here for like fighting crime, 
for example. I don't think that any like law enforcement is using like facial reconstruction yet. Uh, that really they just like take your DNA and like look it up in a database. Oh, it's not in the database. Ooh, I don't know. I guess we can't find them. Uh, but like think about this. They could do like a 3D reconstruction of your face and then like look that up in the DMV database and then like, oh, we've got this guy's driver's license photo and it matches or whatever, like some real CSI stuff where it lays it over and a big green like check mark shows up. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. So I think maybe it's going to lead the way to this. <clears throat> the year is 2020. Littering is rampant. Empire City is swallowed by half-empty Dorito bags. Local biker Mickey Valentine, while on his way to volunteer at a children's hospital, runs over a diaper and takes a nasty spill. After waking up from a year-long coma, he dedicates the rest of his life to cleaning up the streets. Using genome sequencing, the trash man will make sure these litter bugs never litter again. Coming soon to a theater near you, 2018. <laughs> so for the record, this image is real. <laughs> it's from a real article about a motorcycle litter vigilante in Russia uh, who basically, <laughs> when people litter, he gets the trash and he drives, he like, chases them basically, and when they stop at a light, he throws it back in their window. <laughs> True stuff here, folks. Look it up if you want, want some laughs later. This example is DNA voluntarily provided by a guy named Manu Sporni. His DNA is available on GitHub, and using this information, we can determine this set of physical traits. Uh, and these lead us to this 3D model. So you can see while the recreation isn't perfect by any means, uh, it's super, super close, actually. Like, you could definitely see how that's the same person. Uh, imagine what five more years of research in this field will do. Like, like I said, like, this is such a new field. Like, this is bleeding edge stuff. Like, there's so much left to find out. Like, we probably know, like, what a couple thousand of these SNPs do, and there's 967,000 of them that we have to, like, still figure out what the hell does this do. Um, so once we kind of like unravel those mysteries, I could definitely see a world where if this looks perfect, I mean, it's going to have him smiling and everything, like, it'll look good. So we have the data, we have some idea of what we want to do with it, now we need some tools to help us out. Genome.js aims to be this utility belt that helps you deal with this complex data and all this logic behind it. DNA to JSON is a command line tool that takes in any of the sequencer's data, like 23andMe or Family Tree, and converts them to a standard JSON file. So all of these things have like their own custom CSV format. So if you want to work with them, you kind of have to convert them anyways. So the accepted approach here is really like, okay, let's take all these CSV files and like run through them and everything. But we work with JavaScript, so we don't want to do like CSV stuff. Uh, so we obviously want to work with JSON files instead, so this lets you do that. Um, to get started, you just npm install the DNA to JSON CLI. Like in that example. Then you run it against the text or CSV file. So now you have a nice JSON file that comes out, looks a little something like this. And it has some data you can easily work with in JavaScript. So currently the output is an array, like this one of these like little SNP objects. But I'm kind of thinking of like reworking this and how to like optimize it for space because I think when this comes out it's like 100 megabytes or something. <laughs> so probably not optimal. Uh, and I also want to start like thinking about maybe like how I could possibly load this into LevelDB or Redis or something uh, instead of a JSON file. That way it makes it a little easier and faster to, do, uh, to run queries against it. So next up we have this thing called GQL, which stands for Genome Query Language. This is a way to build those genoset conditionals that I showed earlier. Uh, so in this example we have some nested ORs and like some logic and stuff, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so if any of the top, uh, any of the two top level conditions are met, the genoset considers it a 100% match, so you can see on like the third line or whatever. Uh, query that needs to, it's kind of like, uh, this isn't really like an exact matching scenario. This is kind of like a fuzzy match. Like, okay, there's this percentage that this person is gonna have like a higher risk for Alzheimer's or something versus like this person has blue eyes. So some of them are like this. Some of them we can't really get like a definitive match. So 
Uh, this lets you kind of do those percentage-based matches instead. So you can show like risk factors and stuff, <coughs> not, hey, you're gonna have Alzheimer's because we can't do that yet. This is what the norovirus genus set looks like using GQL. So you can see, again, this one is like super simple. It just says, hey, we need one exact match of this thing equaling this thing. Uh, so pretty simple. To run a query against our DNA, we require in our genome.json file, and then we use async to pump all of the rows uh, through query.process. Uh, then at the end, we can check like how many matches we got, which SNPs match, uh, which SNPs match and uh, the percentage of matches. So after you write one of these queries, you can publish it as a module on NPM with the tag genuset, so people can find it. So like with all of these small genus sets on NPM, you can start combining them into aggregate analysis tools. And this is where it gets really cool. In this example, we take multiple genus sets required from NPM, run them against our genome, then check the results. Each genus set runs asynchronously, so more complex, uh, more complex ones that require more SNPs to be processed don't like halt up anything. You can start publishing the aggregate modules to NPM too. So I think like this opens up the possibility for a module, let's say like face, for example, uh, that takes in some DNA and then outputs all facial characteristics it can find. That module could then power something like that art project I showed earlier where you're reconstructing like these 3D models of people. Uh, you could make like a crime API or something that like reconstructs 3D models when somebody uploads DNA. Like this type of stuff is super cool. Um, I think like the most useful one probably right out of the gate would be a module called diet that takes in a DNA and like outputs a list of all dietary restrictions, just true or false, like an object. Uh, apps could then like put DNA through that or consume the module uh, and power like all of these ideas I talked about earlier. Like I think that these aggregate modules are really where uh, like the line between Genome.js and web applications uh, is and like I, I think that they're super important. Uh, so, so far we have a way to convert the data. We have a tool for querying the data and we have a few pre-made queries on NPM. I think I have like four right now. I'm trying to do more. I don't have time. Don't, I don't know. Don't get mad at me. Um, so this is far from being a bustling ecosystem. Uh, I need your guys' help to make this vision a reality. If you want to get involved, you can start by simply going on Snippipedia, taking some of their like uh, genus sets that they already have these pre-made formulas for, and convert them into JavaScript using GQL. Uh, then you just publish them to NPM, and you're already like, I'll give you a high five. Um, so the more genus sets we have available on NPM, the more all of us can actually work with this data. I'm really hoping that with enough help, we can basically create like an open source community powered version of 23andMe. Uh, I don't think that like 23andMe really provides any unique value other than taking this existing research, uh, sequencing your DNA, and combining those two things. I want to see something where like I can just get my DNA sequence for 10 bucks, and then they give me a big file back, and then I can run my own analytics or like upload it and run it through this open source tool on the web or something. Uh, kind of like cutting out the profit involved in this. Before we uh, close out this talk, I want to rejoice in how awesome science is. So let's walk through how they actually sequence these SNPs and figure out what your values are. So first they start by chopping up your DNA into one million little pieces. <laughs> what? I don't know. That's, cra that's just so crazy. I mean, they take a DNA strand and chop it up into a million pieces. Just think about that. Uh, then they wash that over this thing called a bead chip this little thing right here, which is like really the magic behind this whole thing, uh, which has millions of these microscopic, specially crafted hooks that attach to only uh, spe sorry, specific DNA fragments. So that means they like manufacture these things to specifically, like at a chemical level, only bind to specific DNA fragments, one million of them. That's crazy. So after the beads are attached, they like put this chemical on it basically that makes the little things that got attached glow, kind of like that thing down there. 
Uh, the computer looks at the gluing fragments in which beads were hooked to generate the file, and that's what actually contains your mutation data. And all of this is done for under $100, including the shipping of your samples. So this used to be like millions of dollars to get this done, to sequence your genome, because the technology just really wasn't there. Uh, and then you can see it was like tens of thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars, and now we're at the point where you can do it for $100. <laughs> and it's getting cheaper every day. So this chart by the National Human Genome Research Institute shows like just how fast the prices come down uh, in only 10 years, and I think that it's gonna continue along that chart, uh, and I could definitely see a point where it's like a couple of dollars to get your genome sequence. I think that's pretty sweet. So that's pretty much all I have to show. The whole idea of this talk was to do three things. One, interest you in the data. Two, provide the means to get the data and three, give you the tools to play with the data. So hopefully I got some of you thinking about like some fun projects you might wanna work on, like whether that be in art or web applications or just like personal like discovery or maybe like, I don't know, maybe you wanna make something that diffs you against Jaden Smith. That's fine, like have fun with it. Uh, catch me at the after party if you're a movie executive who wants to fund the trash man uh, or if you just wanna chat about this stuff. So thank you, everybody. Uh, does anybody have questions? Yes. She couldn't really get their permission because she didn't know who left it. So, I mean, she couldn't like track the person down. So well, I guess unless she waited, but. Could you imagine a scenario though, going to the genome and then you would see yourself in the alternative potentially? Yeah, I mean, f from a legal standpoint, I, that's a good question. I think that's a point though. I think I would have to be a lawyer to answer that question or like a Supreme Court judge. A good point. I mean, that sounds like something that's gonna make it to the Supreme Court someday. Um, I don't know that. I don't know how to answer that. I, I would assume that if you left something in a public place, that it means it's like public data, and what somebody does with that data is. Well, you can't take a picture in a public place and post on some internet. You can though, can't you? Well, you can take you can, you can take, take photos in a public place. You can. You can. You can. In a in a public place, I think you can you can take photos and whatever. Yeah. Yeah, like paparazzi, like he said. Yeah. There's no expectation of privacy. Yeah. Genetic paparazzi, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> the other question was, can you imagine a scenario like this tackling uh, the, the sensor for the, the iPhones and stuff to, you know, to go, uh, instead of spitting in a thing, uh, you know, DNA will be collected. I mean, can you imagine a scenario like that where the mask could be just on your touch? Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, where you could just like touch and off of your fingerprint, it would like, I mean, I don't know if they could ever, I don't know, I, be, I mean, I bet nobody thought they could take a CPU and make it like as big as the tip of a pen or anything. Like I, I was about to say, I don't think they could make one of those chips that small, but I guess people said the same thing 40 years ago about CPUs, so uh, yeah, I could see a scenario like that. I mean, just like the Apple like fingerprint reader, maybe you just like put your thumb on something and it reads in your DNA. Uh, like when you in install an app from the app store, it's like, hey, this thing wants to know if you get migraines. Cool, boop, I give you permission, put my thumb on it, now you know. 
Um, kind of like the, the genetic configuration stuff I was talking about. Uh, yeah, that would be awesome. We may already be doing that with seam gates. Have you seen that, where the seam of the iPhone 6 is pulling out people's hair? <laughs> no, I haven't seen that. <laughs> <laughs> no, is that before or after it's been? Uh, either way. Okay. No, I mean, it's all MIT licensed. If you use it against yourself and it tells you you have Alzheimer's and then you go crazy because of that, whatever, I'm not liable. <laughs> no, like, I don't know. The, the whole FDA stuff is, is more about how 23andMe marketed themselves and less about, like, the data itself. It was more about, like, 23andMe being like, we can tell you if you're going to have heart disease or something. Uh, which they can't. So it's more it's more false advertising on 23andMe's part than a problem with like telling people about conditions they might possibly have. Have you shown this stuff to uh, doctors or scientists? Uh, yeah, Paul Irish's wife is a geneticist, and I also met like five other geneticists at JazzConf, and there was just like an insane amount of interest from them of just being like. Hey, this is awesome. Like, would you need help with anything? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know anything. Can you help me out with that? <laughs> um, no, so yeah, like, I, I definitely think that scientists would be interested in this because really everything is locked up in these like proprietary things right now, like 23andMe. Uh, the research is there, they're just not able to really like translate it into code. So I think that if we as like engineers come in and kind of make these modules for like actually analyzing stuff, uh, it would not only help us out, but like help out science in general. Do you see DNA being copyrightable or patentable in the future? I think there was a Supreme Court ruling on this already. Didn't they said no? They said no, it's not. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think at one point people were like getting patents for stuff, and then the Supreme Court like was like, no, don't do that. Um, so no. I don't. I don't think unless that gets overturned or something. I don't think that uh, that there's going to be a problem with that. Or do you mean like copywriting your own genome? Yeah, yeah. I don't know why I don't know. Uh, maybe. I mean, you could. You can you copyright a, like a file, like file contents? Really? I, don't, I mean, I'm not too familiar about copyright law. I usually just like whatever. But uh, you can copyright your ideal self. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It sounds like another Supreme Court ruling. Really. A lot of stuff about the Supreme Court. Maybe I should do a whole slide, which is like <laughs> Supreme Court, what they have and haven't ruled on. Maybe how they should rule. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you everybody for having me. Thanks, Amanda, uh, Jesse, and Vance for flying me out here. Looking forward to seeing what Oklahoma City has to offer.